I hate you. I've always hated you. This podcast is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Spoiler warning for whatever is in the title of this episode. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher and Goodreads. Become part of the disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Welcome to episode 96 of the Horror of Babylon, where we review Five Nights at Freddy's, The Fourth Closet. I am Ryan, and with me as always is Daniel. Say hi, Daniel. I am Springtrap. I'm done. (laughs) I'm so done. (laughs) This and one movie and one more episode, I'm so done. All right, all right, all right. Uh, But you know who's not done? Our patrons, <laughs> such as Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons. I, actually, it, it's okay if you guys need to be done. That's totally cool. I didn't mean to. Play. <laughs> also, and Logan, the Full Metal, metal patron. patron, and Ben, ben the Fourth Patron, patron of, of hope. hope, and Mia the Fifth. She the, makes it rain. She's yeah. the rainmaker. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> and thank you to Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, the Mall Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or you can shop online at shop.forhorsemancomics.com. And Ron makes shitty pizza. <laughs> I was going to say he can, like, kidnaps kids, but... I did that in the last one. Uh, yeah, I mean, Afton has one shtick. Yeah. Uh, if you do shop at Four Horsemen or use their online shop, make sure to mention us in the notes or by person. Yes. Uh, trigger warning, child abduction again. Well, this actually does sort of, it is kind of live in the story. Yeah. As opposed to the previous two books. Yeah. So. There's just no follow through with it. No. <laughs> they didn't kill me kids. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. I'm our- mad. We're mad when they kill kids. We're mad when they don't kill kids. <laughs> Can't be happy. Can't be happy. Our history of the fourth closet. I've never read it before. Your turn. I got the trilogy of books, and after I read the twisted ones and almost died of embarrassment, I was literally staring at the fourth closet going... I don't want to read that. I actually... I think I said that out loud. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm going to read this. And I read it. And I was actually... It kind of recovered me a little bit. I was like, okay, you know what? If you're already on board with the fandom, I think the Silver Eyes and the Fourth Closet are perfectly fine. It's absolutely a better book than the Twisted Ones. In a lot of ways, it's better than the Silver Eyes. In some ways, it's not as good as the Silver Eyes. I think, like, in terms of pure writing, it's better. It's much better, yes. In terms of, like, the plot. The the themes. Yeah. I think the Silver Eyes is... In terms of themes, the Silver Eyes is the best... In terms of writing, The Fourth Closet is the best. Like it, pure technicality and pacing. Yeah, absolutely. It has none of the pacing issues that The Silver Eyes has. But but my issue is just that I just, I'm not into it. I'm just, yeah. I don't care. Eh, I, I am a little into it, so it was able to help recover me a little bit. Yeah. Surprisingly, this is the least liked book in the trilogy, at least from what I can gather from the fans. I can't, I can't get behind that. Like, it was... I didn't. I did not love this book at all. But yeah. it it wasn't like torture. There were nobody par- came up to the camera or the page and said, "I am spring trap." <laughs> there were parts of the twisted one where I just want to be done forever, mm-hmm. and like the middle act of the silver eyes was just so hard to get through. I I I still maintain that there is a good version of the silver eyes out there somewhere. Yeah, where someone was able to take Scott and go. You need to. You need to tighten this. Rain it in, buddy. Rain it in. Yeah. The vampires are pure myth. Superstition. I may be able to bring you proof. 
that the superstition of yesterday can become the scientific reality of today. Background, this uh, novel was written by Scott Cawthorn and Kira Breed Reesley, which we just covered them in more detail in the Silver Eyes episode. Mm-hmm. This book was published June 26th, 2018. Online reviews are, are generally positive. YouTube theorists and FNAF commentary community are less kind. In my experience, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but, and- I mean, that's just like the critic score versus the fan score. Yeah, in in my experience, people go very hard on this book for a few reasons, but we'll get into it. What's your favorite movie that has a very high audience score and a very low critic score? Very high audience score and very low critic score? Probably the first Saw movie. The one that jumps out to me is is Super Mario Brothers, which almost has a perfect audience score. Last I looked was 95%, Mm -hmm. and the, the critic score is like... 50 something i still haven't watched it it's so good i love it i'm kind i'm kind of saving it for a special occasion yeah i i know i'm building it up a lot but like it's it looks great it's drake's favorite movie so i've literally seen it over 10 times it it looks like one of those like perfect family movies it is it absolutely is okay oh Oh, I gotta mention this. So okay. we we were at Target tonight, and it's it's close to Christmas, which means we just go through like the toy section, the video game section, the pop culture section, taking pictures of stuff. And Emma and Drake are like, "Put this on my Christmas list. Put this on my Christmas list." And we we're in the video games. We go over to the Nintendo stuff, mm-hmm. and they have all these plushies. And there's this plushy Donkey Kong, and Drake runs up into it and goes, "Monkey Kong!" And I'm like, "Drake, it's Donkey Kong." Monkey. And he, and he looks at me like. Like, no, Monkey Kong makes so much more sense than Donkey Kong. I'm like, you're right, but it's not. It's Donkey Kong. (laughs) I don't know if you uh, saw uh, the meme I made for uh, the movie Nope, but... uh, Yeah. Using the Bowser monkey scene. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Um, That's one of the scenes I like from that movie. It's just, I can't remember that actor's name, but... He tried to have fun with that movie. The Nope movie? No, the uh, the guy who played Bowser in the live action Mario Oh, Jack Brothers. Black. Oh, in the live, live action. action yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now I remember. Yes. He had his hair in like three mohawks. Yeah. That is a terrible movie, but I love that movie. Yeah. Granted, I have not watched that movie as an adult because I'm afraid to. <laughs> I literally watched that movie every time it came on when I was a kid. Yeah. So I'm kind of afraid to watch it now. That was me for the Mortal Kombat movie, so. I wish this was a Mario podcast, but it's not, so. <laughs> anyway, it's, video game related, it's, yeah. it's close. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should do like a uh, video game movie like tier list or, or like our top fives. Or, okay. Yeah. Mine is Mario. <laughs> Surprise. And that's that. Another story in the classic, infallible three-act structure. Good enough for Aristotle, good enough for The Simpsons. Mr. Sislak, I have a feeling there's going to be one more act to this story. Well, I'm not hanging around for that. Four acts. All right, structure and themes. Structure, third-person, omniscient, character's perspective. Same as the other two, but like the Twisted Ones, it's much cleaner. There's not... This uh, this one, I'm going to give a little more props to because... The fir- Silver Eyes had a little bit of confusion when jumping between characters, and that was mostly cleaned up in the Twisted Ones. However, the Twisted Ones also had much fewer characters compared to the Silver Eyes. The Fourth Closet has more characters, but is also cleaner and less confusing. It does almost how Game of Thrones does it, where different chapters almost follow different characters. Yeah. Which is, if you're going to do character perspectives, is how I prefer you to do it, is if you're in a character perspective, you don't shift unless you're shifting a chapter or like a section of a chapter. So yeah, it's structure wise, it was good. Obviously, like we said, or this one is probably the best written of the of the group. Uh, it uses a lot of exposition, but so did the Silver Eyes. Yeah, it's like there's so much like lore and bra- background stuff that you have. To, I feel like you have to have a lot of exposition. Yeah, and I think that's one of the weaknesses when it comes to trying to adapt this to a novel versus a video game where the exposition in the video games are like other little video game segments that you play that kind of like explain the lore or hint at it. Yeah, I where can't get too critical of that. Like, I the number one like thing I read are Star Wars novels and they always have so much exposition, so. Allow me to explain to you the history of the Jedi for the fifth time. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna complain. So. Uh, what, you want to talk to us about some of these themes that you have here? 
Okay, uh, you got depression, loss, and grief. Mostly because this is a, a direct follow-up to uh, the Twisted Ones. John is a sad boy. John is a sad boy. <laughs> Uh, because at the end of the uh, the Twisted Ones, Charlie dies and then inexplicably shows up again. Yeah, well, I know what I knew what was up, but we'll get to, we'll get to that. Uh, then we have AI slash creation, like uh, th this novel, and kind of released around the same time as Sister Location, where Scott did this huge pivot from telling a ghost story to telling a sci-fi horror story. And I think it's super obvious in this novel that he's really more interested in sci-fi, and that's the stories he wants to tell. Yeah, but FNAF I mean, is what it, makes him money. He didn't start as a horror yeah, guy. He did sci-fi RPGs, mm -hmm. and those are what he wants to tell. But everyone wants him to do FNAF, and that's what makes him money. So he's like, okay, well, I'll do a pivot, and then I can tell those stories using these characters. Yeah, I think that's super obvious, especially in this novel. Yeah, and. I, w I hated all the AI stuff in the Twisted Ones. I I was more medium on it in this one. I don't know if it's because I've had more time to sit with it or because it was better done. I think it's better done in this novel. I, I think in the Twisted Ones, it feels a little bit more out of place because we just jumped out of Ghost Children. Mm -hmm. And in this one, we kind of lead with AI. Yeah. Um, then you have Illusions. Same thing as like the illusion discs from yeah, the last I, one. I still am not crazy about that. No one in the fandom is. It was like one of the worst things introduced into the the lore. Yeah, because it kind of it just breaks the lore. Mm hmm. Carlton gets to be invisible. <laughs> the the nature of a soul that comes up, especially uh, with regards with uh, Charlie and not Charlie. Mm hmm. And then we have this one. I I personally love. This is one of the things I do like about the novel, and I wish it would have focused on it a little bit more, is a uh, Capgrass syndrome. You're gonna have to explain that one. Okay. This is gonna this this is sounding super bad when I say it. I was gonna say it's one of my favorite psychological disorders. It's one of the ones I find the most interesting. It's, that's like <laughs> that's like saying my favorite war is World War II. <laughs> yeah, my favorite serial killer. You know? Yeah. And my the one that I find very interesting, and it's when. A person becomes convinced that somebody has been replaced by an identical duplicate. Mm. And it's when your brain uh, makes a, you can make the physical connection, like you recognize somebody, but your brain no longer makes the emotional connection. Mm. And so you logically go, they've been replaced by a copy. Mm. And that comes into play with Charlie and not Charlie for her, like half of the book. Probably, Probably maybe a little a more than half. Yeah. yeah. I honestly wish they would have gone uh, ran with that more, but I feel like it. That's like the main theme to me, or at least that's the thing that I focused yeah, on. Yeah, foc focused on. So yeah. they're coming to get you, Barbara. Okay, so let's talk about characters, uh, and of course, Charlie's no longer our protagonist. It's John. It's John. <laughs> yeah. John is our main character. He's a sad boy. <laughs> he is a sad boy. Uh, he he starts off being a construction worker who can't show up to work on time. It, it's very third in a trilogy. This is coming f like you, if you the middle is your low point, and this mm -hmm. is like building up from the yeah I, the, low point. I remember when I was in high school, we went and saw the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Mm -hmm. and, which is the one that ends with Jack Sparrow getting eaten by the Kraken. Mm -hmm. And I, I walked out of the theater just like, eh, it's Pirates Empire Strikes Back. And one of the people who, who I saw it with screamed at me. I was like, why does it always have to be Star Wars with you? Why do you have to compare <laughs> everything to Star Wars? I'm because like, it's true. It's true. I mean, and that's, I mean, everything copies that formula. Yeah. And, and the Twisted Ones was the same. Like it ends with. Uh, with Charlie being frozen in carbonite. I mean, yeah. yeah. Really does kind of focus on his depression and like how he, uh, I guess, copes mostly by talking to a rabbit head he found. I, I would say mostly he doesn't cope. Yeah. Oh, okay. So under illusions, I meant to write illusions slash, del slash delusions. I'm sorry. I had a couple beers. Who were reviewing it. A not great <laughs> a not, book. Not, I had a not great movie. It, I would say a not great book and a terrible movie. Okay, I agree to that. He's really kind of just stuck in that sort of sad space. 
and people might disagree with me, I, I kind of related to that. I've been in that spot where you just don't, are, you are not dealing with loss or you're not dealing with a sad situation well, to the point you'd rather be talking to a stuffed animal than an actual person. I didn't mind like the first part of this book that's just John and his life and his struggles. I, I thought it was fine. Yeah. Like that's, to me, that's logically what the character would have done. Mm -hmm. It's what, if I were that character in that position, that's probably what I would have done. I honestly think this is the best John has been. <laughs> I agree. I think I hated him in the first book. He was a little better in the second book. And I think he's, he's even better in the third book too. Am I, is he my favorite? No. Okay, but, no, but like he. I, I'm glad he's not a canon character in the game. He's but. he's grown up to be a tolerable boy. Um, I, I wrote down here, he puts the pieces of everything together, but doesn't tell anyone. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to kind of bury the lead on that for a minute. Yeah. But uh, to Ryan, you kind of already said this, is, is he better in his third attempt? Yeah, he's yeah. better. He's, he's better. Yeah, he's better. That's fine. We can go to Jessica now. Yeah. Um, so I never really thought that Jessica was going to be one of my favorites of the group, but <laughs> yeah. she really is. Yeah, she's fine. She's great. And, the, and I started the twist of one saying, Jessica is not the character that I would have kept for this. But by the end of it, I was like, well, she's the one who pissed me off the least. <laughs> yeah, and she just... And, she keeps going. And then by the end of this book, I'm like, eh, she's kind of one of the better characters. She's the character I think is like consistently trying to like solve the mystery and do the right thing throughout the entire of the trilogy. Yeah. What I was really surprised by like all the quote unquote screen time, the page time that they devoted to her with getting kidnapped and uh, being like all the exposition from Springtrap is not to Charlie or to John, it's to Jessica. It's to Jessica. And then she's the one who's primarily responsible, well, her and Marlon and Carlton too, and it, but she's the one who is with the kids and like... Is helping them out. Yeah, like I, I enjoyed like all of her, I enjoyed her story. She's probably my favorite character in this book. She's not my favorite, but I, I also really enjoy her. I have throw robots on here because we talked about that. Yeah, that she was... Th uh, she throws them into the ball pit. <laughs> that's not something I'm going to focus on, but yeah. it, was, it wasn't great. That wasn't great. I, I did like when Mangle was chasing her. I, I would have almost... That's the bad Foxy? Yeah, that's the bad Foxy. It, okay. it, it's the character for, It's a character from 2 that they kind of change in this one. And she was like going through like the play place. And going... Yeah on and off invisible and eventually got it to fall. Mm -hmm. I would have probably even cut out the fucking clowns that she throws and just focused on that, but... Yeah, I mean, I wasn't... The parts I enjoyed of this book are not, like, the action sequences. Yeah. Yeah. It, the Where her and Margot are, like, throwing the clown robots into the ball pit, it's, it's so silly. <laughs> it's not quite silly that it's funny, but it's just... It's, it's whatever. If it would have been, like, 10% funnier, I think it would have worked. I think they needed to have Carlton doing it. <laughs> but You almost needed to switch hit him and Jessica's place. Yeah, but it was also like, it kind of, fit, so let's talk about Carlton. It kind of fit that he was, he's the not serious, he, he's the he's the Richie, because hmm. Richie's thing is like, he doesn't grow up until he has to grow until up. Until he has to grow and, up. And this is, that's basically what happens with Carlton. And he basically stays the Richie throughout the entire series. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not really in the second book to the book's detriment. Yeah. But in this one, he even like, he communicates with the dead kids who was, uh, Michael was his best friend in the book universe. Yeah. And you even kind of get didn't really work for me, but I can see how maybe like somebody who grew up reading this book, that's a heartfelt moment for him. Mm -hmm. I Again, not as much as Jessica, but I was surprised by how much time was committed to Carlton in this book. Especially considering he's not in the second one at all. Yeah, and, and like how, how important he was in the third and final act of this book. So that was that was nice. Um, I have specific things I don't like about the, the third act but we'll get into that later. There's uh, there's one thing that I want to mention about Carlton, and it's that he gets that, like, that quote-unquote, like, hero line where he's like, no one dies because of that son of a bitch anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite as bad as I Am Springtrap. Oh, it's nowhere <laughs> near as bad as that. But I was still like, oh, man, come on, dude. 
I mean, it's written for kids. <laughs> it is written for kids. It it it's written for kids. Yeah. They say teenagers. It's written for kids. But it's I I think like this book's sweet spot is like fifth, sixth grade, like that. Yeah. That age range. Okay, so Clay. <sighs> <laughs> He cleans himself up a bit. Yeah, I mean, he's... Honestly, this is probably his best book, just because I, I don't have to go back into his shit in the Silver Eyes. And then he was better in the Twisted Ones, but he still left those kids alone with those monsters. He asked uh, John to spy on Charlie. He doesn't... Yeah, he does, which isn't great, but it's... At the same time, he seems to know something, which he's not divulging to the one dude who's going, she's not real. And also, like, <laughs> he gets fucked up, so he gets a little bit back of what he's given. So. I honest, This is one of my few complaints about the book, and I know it's written for kids, but kids can handle death. Mm -hmm. And one of the few people I think you could have actually killed it's and people been okay with is Clay. I think it's the adult. Killing an adult, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think it would have been really that kosher to kill one of the kids in this, these books. Yeah. But killing Clay could have been okay. I think that they really should... It's not my coons, but if I could have changed one thing, I would have had him killed in that exchange. Yeah, I mean, because he doesn't even really do anything after that point. Yeah, he has like one line at the end. It also it. it may have also like added a little bit to like Carlton's like sudden... Motivation. Like motivation. Yeah, yeah, and his sudden maturity. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it's whatever. He's he's better than he was in the Silver Eyes. Um, Marla, uh, medical students are not doctors. Yeah. I believe she's in her first year in college, which means she's not even a medical student. It yeah, means she, she's she, an undergrad. She's studying to be a nurse. Yeah, so... I don't know. I mean, I guess, yes. She's... I, I, I would let a person studying being a nurse do first aid on me. I first aid, sure. I probably wouldn't have called them if I found the love of my life in a coma in a box. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Because she was probably one of my one of my favorites from the first book. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, she's not in the second one, which is not her fault. Yeah, until the very end. For some, mm -hmm. Just just to... For the, the twist. Yeah. People can't see that I do quotations. No. So I think she, of the group of them, she's probably the weakest in this, but it, that's not necessarily the character's fault. It's just kind of how it worked out. I, I do like that she has a line where she's complaining to Carlton about never getting to be part of the adventure, and then as soon as she is, she panics. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's something I would do. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, I want to do it. No, never mind. I don't want to. I'm sorry. I don't want the actual ghost children. <laughs> Lamar. <sighs> Shout out for being the smartest character. I'm not going back, and I don't know why you guys went back. <laughs> I love I love that line so much that I wish it was in more horror novels. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a little fourth wall breaky, but it's just enough that it's funny. It, yeah, it's legitimately funny, and it's kind of like... If you really experience something like the Silver Eyes, like if you like, why would you go back? Why would you? And why are you guys continuously putting yourself in danger? And like, just within the context of the Silver Eyes, it's all resolved. Like, there's mm -hmm. no reason to go back. Yeah, obviously, it's not because of all these other things. And he doesn't have that but, information. Yeah, but no, you don't know that. Like, like why are you poking the bear? No, no one other than Carlton ever had a reason to go back to that town. Yeah. <laughs> so. Clay drags them back in the Twisted Ones. I need you to poke around a, a crime scene. Yeah, well, Clay's dumb. <laughs> yeah. uh, Aunt, Aunt Jen. We finally get to meet Aunt Jen. And I don't care. Like, yeah. it, it's like, almost. she's like the Kingdom Hearts 3 of FNAF Silver Eyes trilogy characters. I, I, I honestly agree. I In the first book, I don't think she matters at all. In the second book, tricks you into thinking she matters. Mm-hmm. And then it's the Kingdom Hearts three is there's no payoff for. Yeah, I, I thought honestly that she was going to end up being Charlie's mom, who was just pretending to okay. be. And then no, it's just she's her dad's sister, and I'm like oh, okay. and she doesn't matter at all when she dies. And all right, she she's protecting her brother's secrets from the world. Cool. Yeah, that that's it. <laughs> Not Charlie. Sl slash Elizabeth, maybe uh, that there's arguments over whether or not she's actually possessed. 
Okay, well, so let's just talk about her and Charlie here together. Okay. I'll, I'll just tell you my, my real brief thoughts, and then you can explain all the stuff. Yay! I, f I knew she would, that Charlie was an animatronic. I don't know, like halfway through the Twisted Ones, like a third of the way through the... I'm like, she's something. She's probably an animatronic. If she's not an animatronic, she's something else. I, I think the Twisted Ones makes the mistake of doing illusions too early. So that you're constantly already thinking about that. Yeah, and then, like, the, the fact that she died and reappeared, like... Yeah. Yeah. I... It, it's a book for kids. I think it's an okay twist for somebody in the reading demographic. I would be curious to know if a 10 year old who read this, if they would see it coming. So, okay. Uh, so, so this is, okay. I wanted to mention this. Okay. Um, so when I, when I read this, I, I didn't get too critical of the twist because like, ah, it's, it's written for kids. Maybe some kids would not pick up on that and be surprised. Mm -hmm. So, I'm on the couch the other day playing Pokemon Go and Emma's next to me and she's reading this like fantasy novel series she's reading and uh, it's a it's a young adult book mm -hmm. so same same sort of realm as this but I haven't read it but kind of the feeling I got is maybe it's a little like better written than this but I don't know I haven't read it mm -hmm. it's the uh, Glass Throne series but so I'm sitting there playing and she's reading and then all of a sudden she starts like she throws the book down she's yelling at it she's like she's like so pissed I'm like what's the matter and she's like and she's in the second book she's like towards the end of the second book and it's like they just revealed this twist that I knew from halfway through the first book and it was so obvious I hate it when they do that <laughs> granted her reading comprehension is maybe a little higher than the average kids, but... I, I, I actually kind of assume that about Emma, just because she's your daughter. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't like this twist. Mm -hmm. I have mixed feelings about the twist. The big mixed feeling is a lot of people say it comes out of nowhere. Nuh-uh. That's not true. So when I was doing this reread, I start, started with the Silver Eyes. I told you I was taking notes, and I was just like, how many clues did they start out with? If this twist was a rest up on the highway, yeah. we would have seen signs for it like at every mile marker for the past two hours. And I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, in the first book, I counted five clues. Mm -hmm. um, the big ones are, she sees like the tripart, like marks in her father's workshop, which are mentioned in this book. Mm -hmm. uh, the closets themselves. Mm -hmm. And how she's explicitly, they mention the sizes, and one of them has the littlest girl in them. Mm -hmm. And then the big one is when uh, fucking William Afton looks at her and goes, well, would you look at you? Like, he's recognizing her. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bajillion in the Twisted Ones. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, I honestly think that this is the actual story that Scott wants to tell. He wants to tell a story about an AI that doesn't know it's an AI. And he had to use this book as a catalyst. But I'm also sitting there and going, I don't think it came out of nowhere. I think this is No, what... absolutely did not. I honestly think he started setting it up in the silver eyes. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell people. I mean, if you think it's dumb, that's fine. I mean, it, but... I didn't get it at all in the silver eyes. But it very early in the Twisted Ones, yeah. I started thinking in that direction. And if you are looking for it, I think all the clues are there. Mm -hmm. So... It, I it definitely did not come out of nowhere. If you want to criticize it because it's too obvious, sure. But uh, me, it's a kids book. It's it's fine. Uh, some people don't like it because now there's a lot of like uh like the fan theorist community. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, what if so and so's a robot? Is like some of the theories now. So I mean, you you could that's a thing in like every sci-fi. So I'm like, I don't know what to tell you people. Like, I mean, how many times have they cloned Palpatine? It's <laughs> to just keep cloning them. Oh, yeah, whatever. Clone them again. <laughs> Charlie's dad, Henry, Henry Emily, <laughs> uh, is revealed to have abandoned his living son and wife in favor of a fantasy of a living daughter. Yeah. So I posit to you, Ryan, who is actually a father, hypothetically speaking, uh, one of your children dies. 
do you focus on your living family or if you had the know-how to create a perfect copy of said daughter or son do you do you live with the fantasy well hopefully <laughs> hopefully I, I would focus on my living family the, i think this ties into the like the uh, themes of grief yeah it, it definitely uh puts me back in the like uh georgie dies and bill's parents can't focus on him yeah um which you know on one hand like they lost a kid and that like breaks you in a way that you can never be repaired but on the other hand you're still a parent you still have a living child you still have a responsibility to that child yeah like so it's very hard because you still have to do the the worst thing in the world happened to you you lost a kid but you still have to do the hardest thing in the world which is raising a kid so it, it's not an easy thing to explain hopefully i would not go off into <laughs> fantasy land and create a robot of one of my children but now i do think this story does do uh one th i don't know if i'd call it smart but at least it tries mm -hmm. where it explains that the illusion discs if you're around them too long it fucks with your brain like it permanently fucks them up that helps it, it helps explain charlie's dad yeah so like he's living around it so he's already like his brain's permanently fucked up and he gains just enough clarity at one point to kill himself that reminds me a little bit of uh the orville okay which if you're not aware that's uh scott scott seth <laughs> mcfarlane's Star Trek esque science fiction series. Mm -hmm. He wrote a novella, a, an Orville novella, and the premise of that is that it ba basically it's just the Orville is Star Trek. Okay. Okay. So just these two parents are scientists, and they're and in a, they're they have their lab on this planet. They get attacked. So what do they do with their kid? They put their kid in the hollow deck. And they program them to live like a normal life in the holodeck, and then they leave. And it turns out what happened is that kid was raised by the holodeck for like 30 years okay. in Nazi Germany, and their kid became a Nazi. And that, like, the, the conflict of the story is they take that kid out of the holodeck and have to say, hey, like, you're not a Nazi. Like you were in this like magic room for like 30 years. Yeah. So. <laughs> so like if you, if you spend like all your time in an illusion, it's going to fuck up your brain. I mean, it does. Yeah. It very literally does in this. Yeah. Now, uh, Henry Emily's like letter, his exposition letter that, uh, uh, Charlie finds. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of explains part of the plot that I didn't pick up on the first time I read this, mm -hmm. which is at some point, William Afton finds adult Charlie and he gets it away from him and I, I, I'm, pre I'm presuming that's the first time he's spring locked. You know how like in the first book he shows up with scars. Mm -hmm. So I'm making some assumptions there that there was some conflict between the two of them. He gets the uh, the adult robot away because we know William had it at some point because his daughter gets killed by it and is maybe possessed by it. And then he gets just enough clarity after he gets it away from him. We go, I fucked up. I'm going to I'm going to kill myself. You need to burn everything to the ground, sister. And then she doesn't. Uh, I don't know if that's because she's also influenced by the illusions or if she's just so attached to Robot Charlie at this point. But we also know that at some point she takes little kid Charlie back to the closets and gets teenage Charlie out. Yeah. Which I guess there has to be some sort of like memory transfer going on. Yeah, you just plug in the USB between the two and yeah, transfer like the data. Yeah, there, there has to be something going on like that. That's not fully explained, and I prefer not to be fully explained. I don't think it needs to be. Yeah. Like, you just transfer the data. Like, yeah. They're computers. But that's all the shit going on there with Henry and Emily, I think. None of that, none of this is bad. And none of it is, like, really uninteresting. It's just that... <laughs> you I'm, you I'm don't just, care. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm so disenfranchised. Like, I... I kind of like the silver eyes. Like, there's parts of it I really like. There's parts of it I really don't like. But then, like, the twisted ones just... 
It took so, it's so bad. It took my my interest and it just like drop kicked it into a swamp. Right. I I told you I was a fanboy and I literally almost stopped over that book. I think that and I think I, I said this when we were off the air. If the fourth closet had been the second one, mm-hmm. then that would have been bad because I would have been like, uh, the Silver Eyes is kind of good. And then I read the fourth closet. Oh, this is actually pretty good. And then if it ended on the twist of ones, I'd be like, oh my God, this is so bad. But whatever. Okay. Springtrap, William, David, I am Springtrap, Afton, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> yeah. I forgot Dave. You forgot Dave. Uh, uh, his hate boner for Henry is a little bit more explored in this. Yeah. Which is basically, okay. So his hate boner, from what I can gather, is that Henry can create AI so perfect that they don't need to be possessed because uh, Elizabeth flat out says, Charlie, you're not even possessed by the little girl. You're just a robot. So he can create, he doesn't just create animatronic bears. He can create perfect AI. Uh, He can create life, which seems to be the focal point of Henry's, or uh, Afton's jealousy over Henry. Which is fair, like if, if you make robots and somebody else makes better robots. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And and he wants to go, I want to know how he's creating life. And so he's trying to replicate it through these like very audacious means. Very. My my problem with that comes with the second point is now he's a mad scientist. Yeah. Well, I think it was fine before where he was just a business partner who happened to be like a perverse serial killer. I think the unfiltered truth and fact of this trilogy is is that the villain is not strong enough to warrant three books yeah there's a complex villains and there's simple villains Mm -hmm. and then there's effective and non-effective and they kind of range on a scale right Mm -hmm. in the games he was a simple villain that was effective he was just a he was a serial killer who killed children Mm -hmm. those exist they're super scary they're real in the novels and ever since then because they kind of integrated this personality into the later games i'm sorry yeah me too into him being like this super like pretentious mad scientist sort of character i'm like that's not as interesting to me it's more interesting that he inadvertently created all of this nonsense because he just wanted to kill kids. Yeah. And now it's like, I'm trying to replicate the super science of my ex-business partner. On the plus side in the games, uh, Henry burns uh, William alive, so. Nice. He also burns Charlie alive. Not as nice. Well. Okay, the puppet, which is possessed by Charlie, because there's not a animatronic perfect AI version of Charlie. She's just... The soul was possessed by one of the animatronics. I'll kill you all! <laughs> I'll drive you crazy, and I'll kill you all! I'm every nightmare you ever had. I am your worst dream come true. I'm everything you ever were afraid of. All right, let's 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 go to scary shit, and of course... Child kidnapping returns. But I have to ask... Is this book scary? I don't, again, I also have to like defer to our opinion of the Silver Eyes. Because I don't think this would be scary even to the reading demographic. No. I think the games would be scary to the reading demographic because they're kind of played more straight. Yeah, I mean, and just, it has jump scares. Which... It, ha- it has jump scares and it kind of just like shows children being murdered. It shows them in like eight big graphics, but that's still like... A kid being killed, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not something that you like to think about, regardless if it's 8 bits or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it, th- these books, I do not think, play into the book strengths, which is environmental storytelling, which I also don't know how you do for a novel. No. So. No. Which is why I'm not excited about the movie, but I'm slightly optimistic that I'll like it more than these books. Because you can do that in a movie. Yeah. And also, like, the entire thing of the games is jump scares. Yeah. Plus, it has Matthew Lillard. So I love Matthew Lillard. I also really like Josh Hutcherson. So much. Yeah. So I think we'll see. We'll see. We at least have a cast. Yeah. Um, We'll see. I, it won't be as bad as Exorcist Believer. I believe her it. <laughs> I believe. I breathe. Okay. Breathe it. 
Oh my god, are you Stephen King? No, I'm Dean Koontz. Oh. Okay, so kiss me, fat boy. I have to ask, only because of John's infatuation with Charlie, can these robots smash and would John try? Yes and yes. I, I think absolutely that as sophisticated an AI as Charlie is, she has to be capable of sex. And, and you think that her father like thought that far ahead and was like, I'm going to build the body for this. I think he probably did. Okay. I, I just was wondering, I, I, I know that that's sort of a weird question to ask. I mean, he, he made her basically as close to human as possible. So much so that there are multiple versions of her that age up. Yeah. Like you, you would think that sex would be, a, a, presumably she goes to the bathroom and has downstairs bits. Yeah. Or at least the illusion disc makes her think she does. Yeah. Because they break the fucking ideas of. Whatever. I mean, does she eat? Like, she believes she eats. She ever eat in front of the others? Like, I, I remember they met at the diner and she ordered food. Does it ever say she eats? It, it says she does, but again, like illusion disc food breaks the whole idea. She she ate the Korean food. Yeah, because the whole idea is, is that these discs make your brain fill in what you believe you should be seeing. So John may think he sees her eating the Korean food on the date. And she's really just sitting or there. Thai food, not Korean food. Yeah. Yeah. And so... So maybe she doesn't eat, maybe she doesn't go to the bathroom, maybe she doesn't have she, downstairs bits. And she doesn't even actually look like Charlie. She looks like a, some sort of robot, but they never describe what she looks like. Like, John sees the body and says it looks sort of familiar. If that's the case, then how do you know what anything is anything and who cares? So, yeah, I, don't get me started. I, I hate the idea of illusion discs for this reason. Yeah. There, there's no point in speculating because it could be anything. Yeah. So it's dream theory with extra steps. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. I think as much thought as he put into it and as he planned for her to age up and grow up and have like an actual life, then probably yes. He was so far in that delusion that he was like, I'm going to make sure she can do everything. Fathers absolutely do not like to think of their daughters as sexual beings, but you also want them to grow up and experience life and sex is part of that. Yeah. And I am trying to be a po sex positive parent. <laughs> it is Congratulations. It is extremely difficult for me. You deserve some pets. But I am trying. I believe in you. Um, what, what's next? Oh, uh, Cartman makes some really weird butt comments about sexy Charlie. Did you just say Cartman? Yeah, Carmen. Carlton. Oh my god, you guys. <laughs> that was hella bad. I, th that honestly kind of took me aback, is how he's talking about like the fake Charlie's ass at one point. Yeah, I, I thought that was a little weird, how he kept calling her hot Charlie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a little weird. It was like, oh, like you, I don't know why you're not more into Jessica. You two were like all over each other in the first book. She's the she's the most mature. She's probably the most together of the whole group. Like, I don't know why you're not trying to get up in that. It's because he's actually gay and he's overcompensating. Well, then fine. Just yeah. just just come out of the closet. Come out of the closet. Come out of the fourth closet. <laughs> oh, just be gay. It's cool. Well, your friends will still love you, Carlton. Kings and Coots. Um, my, I don't know. My, my Coots is absolutely the ending with just like Ghost Michael and Carlton. And like, I don't know what's going on at all. I didn't understand it at all. I'm not going to explain it because I know you don't care. <laughs> Which is fine. I, I'm totally cool with not knowing, but just like the, the book was tolerable good at some points not great at some but it was fine until like that last like little bit and i was just like i literally don't understand what's happening 
the ga the games, especially FNAF 3, has this sort of weird, like, you're interacting with the spirits, but in an indirect way. Mm -hmm. But how do you portray that in the book? They're like, well, we just have to make it direct. All right. Well, it's just confusing. It It is. Where in the games, you're like playing an arcade game, but you're doing things that are impossible and glitching. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be you're interacting with these spirits that are trying to communicate with you through like these electronic means. Um, and then I guess my king is the return of not all of the group, but the majority of the group minus Lamar, which it was okay missing <laughs> Lamar. Cassie's yeah. the smartest guy. Yeah, because I mean we got we got more Carlton, we got more Marla, we got at least the one piece of Lamar. So it, it was nice to have. Even though I ended up probably liking Jessica the most, it it was nice that it's focused on more than just Charlie, John, Jessica, okay. like the second book does. So my coons have bounced back and forth between two things. Which are the illusion discs, because I think they break the story. It's on, yeah. Um, I think they could have worked if you would have made them just a little bit more hyper specific. And, and maybe I'm just too dumb to get it, but I don't think so. The other one I've bounced back and forth with is how they portray William Afton as like a super scientist now. I just don't care. Yeah. And I'm like, at least he still tries to torture kids. <laughs> He does. So I'm going to go with illusion discs. He, he kidnaps children and he plans to do terrible things to them. It, it's just for different means now. Before it was because he was just a sicko. Now it's because he wants to try to replicate what Henry could do. Which I guess is motivation. Yeah, it's uh, fine. My king, I'm going to go with... Uh, I can't... This is sort of a bad admission for me. But I kind of like the ambiguous ending of this book. I keep wanting to call him Carlton. John goes to Charlie's grave and walks off with a woman and you don't know if it's Charlie or you don't know if she's really there. I didn't mind that. Yeah. It's the the ghost Michael Carlton business that I just yeah, I, couldn't I, wrap my head around. I don't I, I don't like that. I but the ambiguous ending where you're like, is Charlie back? Is that just an illusion? Is his brain fucked up from illusion discs? Which by the way I mentioned this before. John figures all that out, and he mm -hmm. doesn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And he keeps kind of trying to drop hints at Charlie to see if she knows. He's like, "Man, you read awfully fast." And he even like looks at her at one point and goes, "Did you know about this?" Yeah, she's, she's like, like Johnny number five, just like. Vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> and I honestly think that's kind of funny because he knows what's going on and he's trying to rationalize it, but he's not verbalizing it to anybody else. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Rankings. I did rank ahead of time. Um, I have it as my new number 22, okay. which, which is above River of Teeth and below Watchers. It's two spots under the Silver Eyes and two spots above the Twisted Ones. Um, it's probably even like a little better and deserves a little higher of a spot, but I just, I don't care. Yeah, you don't care. It's don't fine. Care. Yeah. It's, uh -huh. it's not... I don't think it's a bad book. I just don't care. Where are the silver eyes for me? Number 22. Where's your twisted one? Oh, it's right here. Right here, number 26. I can't believe I ranked that below the Confederate. <laughs> yeah. I, I was drunk, but it, the list stays. I mean, if you want, you can edit it at the end of the year, but whatever. Uh, let's see here. I think I have to put it... I, I think I'm going to put it above the Silver Eyes only because I think it's more tightly written. I agree. Uh, most people in the fandom seem to disagree with me, but I'm like... No, eh. it's absolutely not. I mean, that whole middle portion of the Silver Eyes is horrible. I'm like, if you don't like the twists or you don't think the illusion discs make sense, I agree with you. But at the same time, I'm also like, it's it at least has pacing. Yeah, like it was... It was not torture to read. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Um, I just the the themes and the silver eyes, I just are much I, better. I, I think the silver eyes was a skip and a holler from being like an actually like legitimately good book. Yeah, probably. Zombie day. Oh, okay. I've mentioned this a few times. Uh, a bunch of the animatronics in this book are from some of the games. Yeah. 
You got Funtime Freddy from Sister Location. You have Mangle from FNAF 2. Uh, Circus Baby is an animatronic, only she's drawn to be sexy in the comics and written to be sexy in this book for some reason. Which I did not pick up on at all. Yeah. Like, I, I showed you the fan art. Not you, fan art. Yeah. That's official art of her. That's gross and creepy. Yeah. Uh, it, it's gross and creepy for a few reasons. One of which is she might be possessed by a little girl. Yep. The book is a little ambiguous whether over she, she is or not. It kind of goes back and forth. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm also like... If there's any possibility of it. Yeah. Like... No, nope. like I know I make jokes all the time, but at the same time, let's not sexualize dead young girls or alive young girls. And at the same time, I'm also like, why? Yeah. For, for the book of FNAF, why are you making a sexy clown? Yeah. Like, imagine if they did a third it reboot and they made Pennywise sexy. What kind of sexy? Teenage girl sexy. No. No. He, oh, okay, I guess she's supposed to be an adult, but like 21 sexy. Yeah, that's. I still don't like that. Yeah, so. It's the whole, like, yeah, she's 21, it's technically okay, but it still doesn't sit right with me. Yeah. There's okay. a reason I upped my dating gauge. Hey, homework, you are asked by Scott Cawthorn to write a FNAF novel. How do you do it? I don't. <laughs> no, Ryan, this is your chance to make it Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I politely decline. Oh wow! I was expecting you to go on a huge diary. No, like I can't. I have last year. I started two novels. <laughs> okay. And failed to finish both of them. So if I couldn't write a novel about something I'm interested in, there is no way that I could finish a FNAF novel. So. Okay. I take the silver eyes. And I make it more like Stephen King's it. Could I just edit the silver eyes like down? Like yeah, you, you can do whatever you want. Okay, sure. Then I'll edit this. I'll just take the silver eyes and edit it. I I either make it longer or I make it shorter. I absolutely make it shorter. If I make it longer, I make it more like Stephen King's it, where you're bouncing between timelines. I don't think I would do that well. Why don't you? write the longer version and I'll write the shorter version. Because I want to actually include the kids dying so mm -hmm. that there feels like there's stakes. So it's an adult novel. I would probably make it like upper teenager. Okay. But like the deaths wouldn't be gratuitous but like they definitely die. Yeah because this is officially this is a young adult book but it definitely feels like it's written for like, like grade schoolers. Yeah like fifth, sixth ish that that range yeah. but obviously like in young adult novels people do die and yeah like I've, I've read the hunger games yeah like people i haven't i probably should at some point but yeah. um like i mean harry potter people die like yeah. that, things happen like yeah and, like i don't need to like describe how william kills a kid but you can like have one of it like I would build an emotional attachment with, like, Michael. Like, mm -hmm. he would be the Georgie. We start with the Georgie. Yeah. And then, instead of the twisted ones, I would just do something different. Okay. I'll just condense the middle act of the Silver Eyes and call it a day. That's fine. That's right. That would also make it an infinitely better novel. All right. All right. And I'll make it... No. No, screw that. I'll do a, a Lord of the Rings trilogy of FNAF <laughs> and... Charlie is Frodo Baggins and she has to go to Freddy Fazbear of Mordor and she has to she has Freddy's hat and Freddy he can't terrorize the world without the power of his one hat. He looks the most polite. <laughs> she has to cast it into the Fazbear pizza sauce. It can only be destroyed with within the pizza sauce of the the restaurant from which it was created. Oh, I know, I know, you absolutely do not care. But there were a number of retcons in this book. Mm -hmm. The biggest one being that the skeleton that was twitching in the corner wasn't Foxy anymore. Now it was Elizabeth, or the the adult Charlie body being built. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I just thought that was sort of weird on this reread because I read the books back to back. Mm -hmm. Because in the first one, it's definitely implied to be Foxy. Mm. And in 
this book, they're like, no, it was Elizabeth, and the tripod was watching it being built. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, I just thought it was weird. Yeah. No, that is weird. Yeah. All right. Yay. <laughs> All right, uh, question for the listeners. Name game continues this week. We are doing Millhouse. I, I learned this recently. I've known this and forgotten it. Okay. Do you know what Millhouse's middle name is? What? Mussolini. Millhouse Mussolini Van Houten versus Richard Millhouse Nixon. I thought you were going to put him against Mussolini. <laughs> no, I mean, this. maybe if he wins, then he'll go up then, against then he Mussolini. Gets to go. Yeah. Like if, if anyone ever votes on our Kramer episode. We did. We had actually like a kind of a, a very detailed comment. Oh, yeah. I sent it to you. Is it mean if I make a TikTok about that? Probably. So, because that is how Saw fans act. Yeah, I know. I have a podcast with a Saw fan. I'm a Saw fan, and my opinion. He just keeps his <laughs> check. Hey, my opinion is memes aside, he's a serial killer. It's like my Aaron Yeager opinion. It's like, for the meme, I say he did nothing wrong, but it, like realistically, he does everything wrong. Yeah, he kills a bunch of people. Yeah. He, tries, he kills children, so yeah, that's pretty bad. The only people that, uh, I, I will be fair to a jigsaw, the only people he doesn't kill are children. Okay, so he's one up on Aaron Yeager. Yeah. A, uh, a kid gets put in one of his saw traps in the newest movie. I don't like that. The kid lives. Good. Uh, and the and, so uh, it's one up on the Exorcist believer. And it ends with uh, uh, Jigsaw uh, holding the kid's face in his hands and going, "You are a warrior," and then giving him millions of dollars. <laughs> it makes more sense in context. Okay. But I I love that part. Grampus, make us do a solathon. <laughs> Further reading. Mm. Um. Okay. I I do have a few recommendations. It depends on what you like your interest in in this novel specifically. For me, it's the uh, the the Charlie not Charlie thing. Mm -hmm. So things like uh, the body snatchers and who goes there? Who goes there? Which uh, the the book uh, the novella that the thing is based on. Mm -hmm. So if you if you're interested in like people being replaced and that's the sort of thing that like that's what I gravitated towards in this novel <clears throat> in a better world it would have been written as not a super obvious twist from the twisted ones but whatever but I still like that theme yeah like I I mostly am able to say it's a kid's book I'm okay with it yeah how uh, those are those are more like adult reading yeah for more kids reading, if you like this, read, I guess, the short stories. I haven't read any of them. All I know is that Kira Breed Reesley is not... At least the ones that I picked up at the Scholastic Book Fair did not have her name on them. Yeah, th there are a bunch of different authors. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you'll get a lot more hits and misses. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's just... That's mostly true of all short story collections. Yeah. And Goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. I like Goosebumps. I've actually re recently reread some Goosebumps because I can read them in an afternoon. Yeah. And I purposely read them because I had just read this, and I was like, I want to like compare like children's level novels. R.L. Stein's pretty good. They're also in like significantly shorter. I am interested in watching the new the new Goosebumps um, at a uh, thing that they just released a trailer for that's coming on. Disney Plus and Hulu. I still haven't watched the Jack Black movie. I think the first one is legitimately very good. I'll watch it. I'll add it to my Halloween watch list. And I think the second one is passable. Okay. Like it, the, uh, the one thing that the second one has going for it, the kid who plays Ben mm -hmm. in the new It movies, he's the main character in that. Okay, that's good. Yeah, like the second one is fine. Like it, it's it's a passable afternoon but i actually really think like the first one is just like legit like one of the best like kids halloween horror movies like out there is there a twist yes okay there is there is a twist I, i've managed to avoid it then it is it's an rl stein twist okay so i will watch it tonight okay do it <laughs> and then message me because I have something to say. Okay. And it's relevant to the fourth closet. You can edit it. Uh, upcoming on the Horror of Babylon, our next Sunday episode on October 29th is the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Which, which we might be seeing in a group now. Bring it on. Yeah. Bring it on. 
Uh, and then our first Sunday episode for season three, we are reading Stephen King's The Stand. We're covering the whole book in one episode. And of course, that was the first book we did. And this, we're just kind of revisiting this for two years later. Hef is going to be on. We're going to give him a chance to give his thoughts on the book. And then Daniel and I will be kind of telling, you know, what what are our thoughts on a second read? Like, how has it changed? What hasn't changed? Um, I, I will go ahead and say, I think I'm liking Larry a little more than I did on the first read, but we'll see if that, that continues through the whole book. I already really like Larry Underwood, so... Yeah. Um, I told you that I'm already fanboying over Harold again. I haven't gotten Harold yet. Um, the scene I'm on is uh, Fran in the parlor with her mom telling her she's pregnant, and I just... It shocks me that that wasn't in the original book. Like, it seems... To me, like, it, it feels like such an important scene for Fran. But I guess the book ends up just shitting all over Fran, so what does it really matter? I'm trying to keep my Fran opinions in check until I get to the end. It, it I'm kind of setting myself up for the same thing, because I'm still, like... In, I'm in book one, I'm like, I think Fran is just the best character in book one. And then she's, like, nothing by yeah. book, like, two. In book two, she's present a lot, but she's just, like, Stu's girl. Yeah. She's pregnant, and she's Stu's girl. And then in book three, she's just like totally gone. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, we're yeah, not. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then we've had a few beers. Uh, not going over the schedule, but after the stand, the the first novel we will be reading will be Battle Royale. So excited by Koshun Takami. Uh, and then our next few bonus episodes. Our next bonus episode on Thursday, October twenty sixth. Alien Covenant. Alien Covenant, which. I'm not so much excited to watch, but I'm excited to 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 see because I, I've seen it, but I don't remember any of it. So I'm just kind of excited to re-experience it. I'm sort of anticipating like what my like comparison to Prometheus is. It's a very, very different movie. Yeah. Like this one feels a lot more like an alien or more like aliens because it has lots of xenomorphs. There's lots of guys with the machine guns. There's lots of shooting. Like, yeah, really, Scott got his opinions of Prometheus, and he's like, "Fine, fuck you. I'll just put a million aliens in there." It's just what's weird is it's is just like Danny McBride. It's just like the Danny McBride alien movie. It's who's Danny McBride? Have you seen Pineapple Express? Yes. Uh, not not Seth Rogen, not James Franco. The other one. The other one. The okay. drug dealer. Okay. He's it. He's in a lot of Will Ferrell and uh, Seth Rogen movies. Okay. He, he has a big role in the... Did you know he was also, like, a producer and one of the like the creative people behind The Exorcist, The Believer? <laughs> okay, so... Just because we're talking about it, is... There's, a uh, I I watched this one uh, review series, Red Letter Media, and they mm -hmm. did a review on Exorcist, Believer. Mm-hmm. And they're talking about the segments that talk about like uh, other cultures, religions, and races. Mm -hmm. And then they pull up a, they don't even say anything. They just show a screen while they're talking of all the producers and writers. And they're all white men. Just like the majority of movies. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like, <laughs> they're like, man, isn't it strange how they portrayed such and such thing? And then <laughs> it's just like they show the screen again. <laughs> Five Nights at Freddy's has a female director, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emma something. That's cool. Um, I, so, be I believe Scott chose her directly. Cool. So We'll see. We'll see. Um, not that, you know, women are inherently better it's, at directing. It's just, it's nice to see someone who isn't a white man. And, or or writing. We just got done reading this over us. Yeah. And also, like, the uh, uh, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines was directed by a woman, and it wasn't very good. Not... Yeah. Not because she was a woman, just because... I'm just interested in different perspectives and, like, how it yeah, comes off. exactly. We just... We need to have more than just white men in these creative roles. Yeah, you know, behind... Like, I love the only good Indians. Yeah, that was, Oh, so good. We need to read... God, do we have another one of his books on our season... Our next season? No, but we don't have anywhere near a full schedule for season three, so we will definitely put one of his... He has a trilogy. Yeah. I don't know if we want to do like a trail, but we'll look. We'll do something. Okay. Um, and also, I know he has like a uh, uh, his love letter to slasher films. He wrote a book about that. 
I I would read anything. He I would give anything he wrote a shot. And his books, like I was looking at the only good Indians today at the bookstore, and it has like a book club edition that comes with uh, discussion questions in the back. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. So I that should be like a pre-show where we, sometime where we take those questions and and rediscuss the only good Indians with. Um, so that's cool. I just, I love that book. I like that author. And he's here's a fig leaf for you. <laughs> okay. Um, We've been rambling for like ten minutes. Upcoming, yeah, I think we're good. So read the stand, read Battle Royale. We'll, we'll announce the next book coming up after Battle Royale soon. But those are the next two, next two novels. Okay, and hopefully. Those will be read by Abigail the First, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan, the, the Full, full metal, metal Patron, and Ben, ben the, the Fourth, fourth Patron of Hope, pope. and Mia the Fifth, the Rainmaker. She makes it rain. So, and Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, the Mall Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or you can shop online at shop.forcemancomics.com, and you can say hello to Ronald the Third, a Grampus of Christmas, who actually just opened a new like sister location to Four Horsemen Comics called Horseman Baby Pizza and Laser Tag, uh, which actually try a lot there was a movement to try and get ron to open like a laser tag place in morgantown for a long time really yeah um there's like near the morgantown mall there's like a shop and save that's been empty for like years and years and a bunch of people tried to get him to buy that and put like the store on the first floor it was a two-floor shop and save so like the store on the first floor and like laser laser tag, tag on the second floor which is an awesome idea and a terrible idea I would invest. <laughs> yeah, I'd, we'll just we'll just take all the Patreon money we have and just reinvest it there. It and he'll just pay it back to us in Patreon money. Just make the laser tag happen. <laughs> oh, also when like the Sears went out of business at the Morgantown Mall, they they were talking about getting the Sears location, and but that's just too like big of a space. Yeah. Okay. Um. I love you, Rod. Yeah. I love that guy. He's pretty cool. I mean, we make jokes about him, like, kidnapping and children and doing bad things, but he's a pretty cool guy. Yeah, but he runs with the jokes. Yeah, he does. Also, you suck. Um, but uh, thank you for rereading Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes. I think I should be thanking you. I read them. Yes. I did not. There are no cliff notes. I checked. <laughs> there are no spark notes. I didn't read the graphic novel versions. I did pick one up and like flip through it to see what like all the characters looked like i do not like the art that they use the kids are fine like charlie and john they're all right <coughs> i have a uh, I follow a dude on twitter who redraws scenes from those graphic novels but he draws them like hyper realistic and like actually like scary hmm. that's interesting yeah i mean it's like if junji ito picked up fnaf and decided to draw it I think that sounds cool, but again, like those graphic novels are for kids, so yeah. how it is is probably how it should have been. But Pro uh, probably, but yeah. I would be curious to see what, at, as an adult fan into a chil that's into a children's franchise, yeah. I enjoy that. Yeah, no, I I would be curious to see what Junjito, how Junjito would draw a Freddy Fazbear. I'll, I'll send you the uh, the spring trap from him later. That's all right. You can, just, you can just miss me on that. Miss me on that spring trap. All right. Thank you to our patrons. Stay tuned for our socials and stay scary. Stay scary, everybody. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that the Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Stay scary. Mm -hmm.